coming up in the program. The historic village needs support. Guess who's coming to dinner in Morrinsville? Tauranga's public art policy and pay it forward, the charity. Kia ora, welcome to Central News for Tuesday, February. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Running gear and sturdy footwear replaces togs and IRBs this week as people prepare to take on the community-spirited challenge of walking up the mount 38 times in 50 days, raising vital funds for surf lifesaving. Starting this Friday, 93.4 More FM Tauranga in collaboration with Surf Lifesaving New Zealand Eastern Region is running the Mount Everest Challenge, which sees people hiking the equivalent of conquering Mount Everest. Climbing the mount at 232 metres, 38 times, equates to scaling the height of Mount Everest, 8,848 metres, albeit without the altitude sickness and oxygen deprivation. So people are being encouraged to say thank you to the Surf Lifesavers by taking on the challenge of 38 summits in 50 days between Friday, February the 13th and Friday, April the 3rd. Recent rainfall has reduced the region's fire danger, rating enough to allow Western Bay Moana Rural Fire Authority to begin reissuing fire permits to the public. From yesterday, residents can apply for temporary fire permits but will not be issued with a season-long permit, says Principal Rural Fire Officer Alan Pearce. A suspension on all fire permits has been in place for the past three weeks after continuous dry hot weather raised fire danger levels in Tauranga City and the Western Bay to extreme. There will also be restrictions on the size of certain types of open, uh, open air fires. Campfires, garden and rubbish fires will be limited in size to a one by one metre footprint. The restricted fire season will continue to April the 30th, 2015. The fire authority will assess the fire danger on a daily basis. Waikato District Council is asking for feedback on amendments to the Waikato District Council speed limit bylaw of 2011. Council has confirmed 16 proposed amendments to the current bylaw are being considered and will be undertaking a 20 working day public consultation period starting Monday the 16th of February. Detailed plans and maps showing the proposed changes to existing speed limits will be available on the council website waikotaldistrict.gov.nz from that date. Waipa District Council wants to build a three metre wide, four kilometre concrete cycleway walkway to link both towns. Construction of the cycleway has been tentatively planned for 2016 to 17. If it goes ahead, the $1.2 million facility would be paid for by a loan, paid off by ratepayers over 20 years. The cycleway is one of a small number of community projects being supported by the council as part of its draft 10-year plan. The plan to be formally released to public comment in March outlines the council's intends spending money on over the next decade. Most of the proposed spending is taken up with core services, including upgrades to water infrastructure, roads and community facilities to support the district's growth. The proposed cycleway is one of a small number of community projects being considered, alongside a new museum for Te Ao Mutu, a pool upgrade for Cambridge, and the development of Waipuki Park at Lake Karapiro. Now for our region's weather, Hamilton, your Wednesday will be fine with an easterly breeze, 26 and 11. Waikato, the same, fine with an easterly breeze, Pairo 25 and 14, Matamata 22 and 13, Te Aumutu 26 and 11, and Tokoroa 23 and 10. Tauranga, fine with light winds with 24 and 14. The rest of the bay, mainly fine, a few showers about the eastern ranges with southeasterlies. Tupuki 22 and 13. Looking to the marine forecast now, easterly of 15 knots for west coast Raglan and a moderate southwest swell at times. High tide is at 3.36 in the afternoon. 
East Coast, Bay of Plenty, southeasterly of 20 knots and mostly fine out there. Your high tide is at 1pm. Still to come on Central News, pay it for the charity. But up next, Historic Village and needs your support. Welcome back to Central News on TV Central. Tauranga's historic village will be put under the spotlight later this year when earthquake strengthening assessment is carried out. However, a recent survey found some structural problems already. So a fire safety assessment report was done on seven of the buildings down at the historic village and we're yet to have the full findings but um, I understand that there are a few concerns with one or two of the buildings so uh, that will be sorted out in due course. Will the council look at funding some of the repairs to the buildings? So I wouldn't say they're damaged, I think the main thing is maintenance and looking after the buildings and we've got to remember that the historic village doesn't receive any ratepayer subsidy unlike other community facilities so I think it's been a, a poor cousin compared to other community facilities and during the 10 year plan the elected members are going to consider funding options on a spectrum of levels so yeah I think it's uh, time that we consider putting in some funding into the historic village to maintain what we have here. Some building assessment work is going to be carried out later in the year, what's that going to involve? So a seismic assessment of the historic village is going to be carried out around July. Just to see, um, central government are putting more and more legislation onto local governments and under the Building Act, um, that's one thing that needs to be done. Yeah, Realising that we've got historic buildings down here, so hopefully they'll be assessed in a different manner to, say, a commercial or residential building. Will Council look at funding some of the seismic strengthening? The Council will be putting some, oh, sorry I should clarify, the Council is putting funding into the seismic reports and then the elected members will then have a discussion once they're aware of the results. There has been a lot of debate around whether the historic village is still viable. Do you think that it still has a place in today's community? Absolutely. I don't know there's been a lot of debate about it. I think sometimes media reports get a little bit um, out of kilter, but I think there's a huge support for the historic village. This is a great community, a diverse community that works really well down here, and I think it is valued by the community. Do you think residents could do a lot more to support the Tauranga Historic Village? We do have friends of the historic village, an active working bee that come down here once a week to do gardening or do some painting or add value to the historic village, such as planting daffodil bulbs along the fence line at the front of the historic village. And we could do with uh, more volunteers for that, so if anyone's interested in helping with the friends of the village, that would be welcome. In the face of opposition to the historic village, how do you remain so passionate about it? Um, I don't think there's as much opposition to the historic village as one might imagine. I think there's a lot of support out there and I think often you just hear one or two negative things but I think there is a lot of support and uh, we've got some great things happening down here. The Lions are going to have their markets down here from March uh, this year. so. That'll be ideal, add more vibrancy and be an ideal setting and offer opportunities for the local communities to come down and be part of that. If money wasn't an issue, how would you envision the place? Well, even if I had unlimited money, I think um, it's all about people, be empowering people actually. Um, if I did have unlimited money, perhaps I'd look at a, a train or something to go around the historic village and open the blacksmith up again and perhaps have more activities but that is gradually happening and uh, there's more events happening down here. The Jazz Festival, Multicultural Festival and lots of other people are booking their events down here. So I think a lot of that will happen anyway. Uh, unfortunately with OSH regulations it tends to put a damper on a lot of things around New Zealand. That's a pity because I see a lot of value in 
having activities like a train or opening the blacksmith up to a, a real workshop uh, so people can learn. I think there's lots of opportunities to add value in that way. If you'd like to become a friend of the village, you can get in touch with them at villageon17.co.nz. Now to the arts. Wallace Gallery in Morrinsville has been busy over the last couple of weeks with the new director, Justin Jade Morgan, settling in. I spoke with him and the outgoing director, Leah Murphy, about some upcoming events. Uh, we have currently on at the moment and through to um, March the 19th, uh, the Peter Gibson Smith 31st, uh, 31 year survey exhibition. So it's looking at Peter's works over that 31 years that have been collected by the Wallace Trust. Um, so it's a wide survey of works that look at uh, painting and sculpture and also some other construction works as well. Leah, how would you describe his work? Oh, I'm a big fan. His pieces are very large that we have exhibiting at the gallery at the moment. Uh, we've got some nudes, but they're in like gorgeous European style, um, classic style nudes. So I'm a big fan of his work. And another uh, exhibition that you have coming up in the community gallery is Candy Coated Coma. I love that name. It sounds so intriguing. Tell me about that. Uh, it's an exhibition by Aaron Smith, and it's looking at the idea of identity, national identity, but using candy and pops of colour and sweet things to, to tell that story and merge it together. So it's like almost like a pop art exhibition in a way. So there's literally candy on the walls, or...? I guess you could say so, yeah. Wow, it sounds very intriguing. We'll have to come along to check it out. So what else have you, events have you guys got uh, planned for the rest of the year? Uh, we do have an exhibition um, called Summer into Autumn by David Huang, uh, which is a celebration of colours that look at the burst of, well, the burst of colours from summer into autumn. So that's that, that beauty of, of nature, I guess, and capturing that and moving forward. Uh, and Lindsay Muirhead has a, a show as well, uh, which is capturing the light and mood of New Zealand landscape, which, which I guess dovetails into the other show as well. We also have a great event in October. The gallery actually has its fifth birthday in October, so we're still in the planning stage with mm. that, but we're planning on having a big week celebration and lots of events in October for our fifth birthday. <gasps> so that's something to um, keep posted about and yeah. Yeah, um, fifth birthday, that's quite a big it's achievement. It's gone by fast, it really has. Yeah, well, so what has happened over those last five years for the Wallace Gallery? We've had a lot of visitors in the tens of thousands, obviously pulled off a couple of art festivals, a couple of art auctions as well as a dinner party. So we uh, had a lot of large events as well as continuous exhibitions, which has now reached just over 200. So it's been a busy five years. 200 exhibitions? Yes. In five years, I can't do the maths on my head, but that's a lot of exhibitions. Well, with three exhibition spaces, it does um, tally up to that. But yeah, it's, it's just about having variety and a lot of changeover for people just to see a wide range of art. Now, tell me again about this dinner party. It sounds like so much fun. So on March 5th, we have Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. We did it last year and it was backed by popular demand. We've had a lot of people interested. So people come to the gallery and have drinks and nibbles. They then find out where they're going to go for a two-course dinner. It's a local Morrinsville person, but it's a surprise. You don't know until the night. And then they come back for drinks and nibbles. So it's a four-course meal and two glasses of wine for $50. So I think that's a pretty good a pretty good night for everyone to have. That is. And do we get to critique everyone afterwards on their meal, like on the program? <laughs> it's going to be delicious food, so I'm sure all the feedback's going to be good. And what kind of art will you have uh to exhibit on the night. The exhibitions that Justin talked about is what we'll have on at that time, so a really good variety for people to have a look at while they're at the gallery having a drink. If you'd like to find out more or be part of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner on March the 5th, visit morrinsvillegallery.org.nz. Coming up after the break, Tauranga's art policy and paying it forward. Welcome back, you're with Central News. Many cities around the country already have an art policy and you now have the chance to offer insight into Tauranga City's art. The aim of the this policy is to encourage public art that enhances our environment and contributes to the character and identity of Tauranga. 
Um, in writing this policy, Council is acknowledging that public art has a number of benefits for the city. Um, it helps create a sense of identity, sense of place. Um, it assists in creating a city that's vibrant, dynamic, engaging. We want those things for Tauranga, so we want to encourage public art um, and all the benefits that it has. And specifically, Council wants to encourage public art that's of a really high standard. We want artists to think about the environment that a piece of art's going into. Um, is the artwork that they're developing for a public space appropriate to the environment? Have they considered the social meaning, the cultural meaning of the spaces that they're going into? Um, does that piece of artwork enhance living and working in Tauranga? That's really what we're looking for. Um, Tauranga has it's got a strong Māori history, it has lots of new multicultural um, communities, it's, a, it's one of the fastest growing cities in New Zealand and it's got lots of innovation, entrepreneurs. There's lots of things in terms of art that art can speak to. It talks about who we are, where we've come from and where we're going. Can you give us some examples of public art around the city? Sure. We've got the gourd sculpture behind us here. Um, so it covers things like fountains. So there's more of those down on the waterfront. Uh, we have the Matariki Po down on the waterfront. Uh, the three whales in the Papamoa Library. Um, the Po at Gate Pa. Uh, mosaics on the footpath. Uh, all kinds of things. It would cover things like a photography exhibition in a park. Um, all forms of artwork. So this policy will cover exhibitions? Yeah. Yep, so it covers both temporary and permanent art forms. Yeah. Are these amendments to an already existing policy or are these something kind of new altogether? Uh, this is a brand new policy. So um, we're not required by legislation, it's been asked for by the um, community of Tauranga um, and it's really about creating a, a process, a way forward that artists can apply to do public art uh, in Tauranga. What did these artists say that they said we need a policy that bad? I think it's been a, a question that's been around for a few years. Um, a lot of other cities in New Zealand have public art policies and it's around what the community um, can do in a public space. What is a public space? What is art? What do people want to see in Tauranga? And I think people have been asking those questions for quite a while um, and they've certainly approached councillors around that um, saying, well, how does an artist know how we can create a piece of artwork on public land? Um, what's allowed, what's not, um, and who gets to create that. What is a public space then? A public space, okay. Now there's big debate about public and private, um, particularly all over New Zealand. And for this policy, we've, we've looked at, we've got a street use and public places bylaw, so we're using the same definition of public, public spaces or public places, and that is council owned or administered land. So public uh, buildings, footpaths, street spaces, parks, reserves, anything that council looks after and maintains on behalf of the public is a public space. Who owns public art? <laughs> Essentially the public does. Um, council maintains the land, it's done so on behalf of the public. Events and event funding have been quite a uh, contentious issue for council, so are they going to be covered by this policy? Uh, some events will be covered or dealt with in this policy, so we've made sure it doesn't overlap with anything else, but temporary public artworks, so anything that is in place for less than three months, we're going to deem that that's an event. So if you want to hold a photography exhibition, you want to have a music concert in a park for an evening, um, those kind of things, uh, yarn bombing, chalk works, something that's not going to be, be permanent for the city, that will just go through our normal um, events process. So it checks off health and safety, any transport, rubbish requirements, those kind of things. Make sure we haven't got double bookings that you're trying to have a concert in the park or somebody else is having a wedding, those kind of things. So there's no, um, no doubling up of process. Drop-in sessions will be held on Wednesday the 11th of February at Bay Court from 3.30pm to 5.30pm and Tuesday the 24th of February at Creative Tauranga from 11am to 1pm. Our Tauranga Facebook page looking to help struggling families is on the hunt for a major sponsor and central hub as it eyes plans to register as a charity. I found out what Pay It Forward is all about. Um, Koha Aotearoa came about from the community, wanting to help the community. Um, we're about taking on um, any un unused items around the home and extra food that you may have spare to give to other families in need. Uh, we're a Facebook group, but we are wanting to break, branch out into the public to have premises. And I'll pass it over to Anita. 
I, I think one of the main things about uh, having premises is that people then have a central space to drop things off and so uh, if they've got excess fruit on their trees or from their garden, a lot of those kind of things aren't accepted by normal organisations and food banks but we're quite happy for people to come in and barter, bring some excess stuff they've got and then, you know, had a farmer come in and dropped off a whole lot of meat and then took some clothes for his kids and that's the kind of thing that we're trying to encourage so that whatever you've got excess of and you're lacking, we can have be a one-stop shop to help people out with that. You're planning on registering as a charity, why is that? Because if, if you register it as a charity, people actually take you seriously and they know that you're in there for the long term. You're not just a pop-up group that's just there to get publicity and then disappear. There is also um, funding available for charity organisations that isn't available if you're not registered. Uh, to move forward, which we are going to do into premises, we're going to change our name to um, Heart Ayotearoa charitable trust which means that to do that we want everyone to know that we've got our own identity and we're there to support everyone's needs. Our main people that we actually focus on and help is actually the working class families, the middle to low income families. Um, which is why we express that we need to be a charitable association so that businesses will actually take us seriously. And Anita, you guys actually have a whole bunch of amazing volunteers that help you out. Yes. Uh, I, I sort of came on board because I had a whole lot of bedding that we'd been given and, and used and didn't need any more and I was looking for somewhere to give it away to and so I came across Pat Ford Aotearoa and then thought, cool, this is an organisation, that's great. And so that's how I came on board and I think that a lot of other people have either been helped by the organisation or they've wanted to help and then have just become part of things. So it's a really grassroots sort of bottom-up kind of organisation. Yeah, the, um, expressing on that, we actually um, opened up because we had a lot of um, self-employed people that at Christmas time they had no income, no pay, so they were struggling. So um, they said to us, you know, we're struggling, we, we are ad admin other buy and sell um, places on Facebook, so we could see that they were selling their own property and, and personal items, and I asked them why, and they said, because we've got no food, we can't go to the likes of Wins we, to get an appointment, it might take us ages. Um, so those people have actually come on board and now they're, they're paying it forward and we have seen it. it probably 98% of the people we've helped have actually now turned around and, and they're on board as, as volunteers and either um, coming in to wash clothes that we get given to us, pick fruit off trees for other families in need or donate stuff. You can get in touch with them on facebook.com forward slash pay it forward free food and support. You can get in contact with us if you'd like to on our Facebook page, centralnews.tv, or email us, news at tvcentral.co.nz. On tomorrow night's programme, we look at antibiotic resistance and the importance of protecting our eyes. Until then, I'm Hilary Entwistle, and I hope you have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.